The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In the previous episodes, we began to ask and answer various classic questions about death, hell, and the afterlife. Our goal was and is to provide correct definitions and a biblical worldview framework from which we can biblically define and understand various words and terms commonly used regarding death, hell, and the afterlife which oftentimes cause some confusion. More importantly, our goal is to allow God's truth and reality to provide tangible hope and joy for our eternal future for those who would by His grace be called to do so. In the previous episode, we identified 14 terms for definition and discussion. At this point, we have largely defined and discussed the first six terms including death, the intermediate state, sleep, the grave, Sheol, and Hades. In this episode, we continue with questions, definitions, and discussion regarding the remaining eight terms including Gehenna, Tartarus, Paradise, Abraham's Bosom, hell, purgatory, lake of fire, and heaven. With this in mind, let's return to our vocabulary and terminology list and proceed to define the following terms according to a proper biblical world and life view. Number 7. Gehenna the word Gehenna has a distinctive place in our current list of terms regarding death, hell, and the afterlife. The reason that the word Gehenna is special is because it is the only word which has an actual, physical, geographical, archaeological, and historical place which one can point to on a map. 
The word Gehenna is a compound Greek transliteration of the Hebrew words Gi, meaning valley, and Hinnom, meaning of the sun, or children of Hinnom. Now, apparently Hinnom was some ancient hero long forgotten to which this particular location later became associated. What is known is that as early as Joshua's time, in Joshua chapter 15 verse 8, we find the mention of the valley of the son of Hinnom. A historical research of this reveals that this valley, which is south of Jerusalem, was where some of the ancient Israelites who had fallen into the surrounding pagan practices of the Canaanites passed their children through the fire, thus sacrificing their children to the false Canaanite god Moloch. The reference of this practice can be found in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3, and 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 6. Also, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, and Jeremiah 19, verses 2 through 6. Several evil kings of Judah, including King Ahaz, used the Valley of Hinnom for their demonic practices, as mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3. Because of the heinous, idolatrous practices of the Canaanites, God forbade Israel from having anything to do with the Canaanites. God so despised the false gods Moloch and Baal that he explicitly forbade following their customs and warned repeatedly of the impending judgment should they disobey. As a consequence for Israel's disobedience in this and other matters, God in fact divided Israel and took them into captivity. After 70 years of exile and captivity, the Jews were allowed back into Israel to rebuild. Upon their return, the Valley of Hinnom was repurposed from a place of demonic child sacrifice to a burning rubbish heap. The Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, became a place where the corpses of criminals, dead animals, and all manners of refuse were thrown to be burned and destroyed. Because the Gehenna Valley was now a permanent des designated garbage dump, the dumping, burning, destruction, and decay never stopped from the time it started. It was literally a place of burning sewage, burning flesh, and garbage. Maggots and worms crawled constantly through the waste, and the sticky, strong-smelling smoke and odor never ended. The location was a place utterly filthy, disgusting, and repulsive to the nose and eyes. By the time of the New Testament, rabbinic literature borrowed the all-too-familiar vivid imagery of Gehenna as symbolic analogy for the type of punishment and torment which awaited the unrighteous and ungodly. It was also the imagery which Christ and the New Testament writers used to communicate these concepts to their audiences. In summary, because Gehenna had been in physical existence on earth in the day-to-day -day culture of the Jews and of the Judeo-Christian, Gehenna was not expected to cease. Thus, Gehenna, as well as all of its aspects, including the fires, the worms, the suffering and destruction, would be perpetual throughout eternity. Gehenna, in fact, became the ideal visual reminder of the fate of the unrighteous who would be justly punished by God. It became associated with the abode of the damned, and as time and linguistics changed, the term Gehenna would later, as we shall see, become synonymous with the English word hell or lake of fire. So, having looked at the historical and cultural aspects of Gehenna, we should be careful to observe two important issues. 
The first issue is that the rabbinic sources, the Jews, Jesus, and the New Testament writers who used the term Gehenna were drawing upon known Jewish cultural imagery known to their audience in order to convey ideas about a future punishment to be visited upon the unrighteous, the ungodly, and or to those who reject God. This type of analogy is sometimes referred to as the genre of Jewish apocalyptic literature. The Jews themselves understood and recognized this genre and its various metaphors for what they were. Now, in contrast, the literature and culture of today typically reads the Bible through the prism of a postmodern Western European framework. As such, we would tend to incorrectly marginalize Jewish apocalyptic literature as myth, lore, and fantasy. Some would see the Jewish apocalyptic genre as filled with contradictions, errors, and exaggerations. The typical example of this would be Mr. Ash, who would complain that Gehenna, or as is sometimes translated hell, is a place of fire. Yet, at the same time, Gehenna is said to be a place of darkness. Likewise, Gehenna is said to have worms and maggots. Yet, we are supposed to be talking about a spiritual dimension. So essentially, Mr. Ash finds difficulty and contradiction between terms which are mutually exclusive or impossible if we take things according to a serious scientific genre. However, Mr. Ash forgets that the Bible is not a scientific journal, but rather both the authors as well as the audience who were familiar with the genre of Jewish apocalypse, knew that they were dealing with an apocalyptic literature which characteristically contains an expected level of metaphor and symbolism as part of its genre. At the same time, these writers and audiences understood that despite the fact metaphors and analogies were being employed in the vehicle of Jewish apocalypse, this did nothing to undermine the fact that certain realities still lay as the backdrop to which these imageries pointed. The case in chief for this is in fact that Jesus uses the term Gehenna eleven times. A classic example of Jesus' use of the term Gehenna is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Quote, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into Gehenna, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into Gehenna, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into Gehenna fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Unquote. So, if there were no such place as Gehenna, regardless of what the title is for this place, Jesus would not have referred to it unless it actually existed. If Jesus is fully God and fully man, then Jesus would be in the best position to know with certitude. Further, if Gehenna was not what everyone else had manufactured it up to be up to this point, then Jesus would surely take one of the twelve times he mentioned it to clear up the confusion. 
Instead, in every case, Jesus confirms and reinforces the progressive revelations which he had provided through his word up to this point. In point of fact, Jesus' references to Gehenna tell us that unlike Sheol slash Hades, Gehenna was and is a place of final judgment and eternal conscious punishment. Since this is the case, Gehenna was also understood to be the final state and thus not part of the intermediate state. While the fire, the worms, the maggots, the garbage, the smoke, and stink may all be metaphorical symbols, the substances which they represent for suffering, punishment, and the final deplorable, miserable, and eternal conscious existence for the unrighteous and ungodly are nonetheless a reality. Number 8. Tartarus. The Greek word Tartarus simply means, quote, deep place, unquote. This Greek word is used only once in all of the Bible in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Like the Greek words Hades and Gehenna, the Greek word Tartarus was already a proper noun at the time Peter used it. Like Hades and Gehenna, Tartarus had a pre-existing cultural and historical understanding which was distinctive to its Greek audience. In Greek mythology, Tartarus was a primordial deity that existed before the Olympian gods. It was also a geographical place far below where Hades was located, and it was used as the most horrible prison where ferocious monsters and horrible criminals were banished. As far back as 400 BC, Plato wrote that souls were judged after death, and those who received punishment were sent to Tartarus. So, as we come to the time of the New Testament with an audience steeped in Hellenistic culture, the term Tartarus would conjure up the familiar idea of the deepest, darkest, and lowest level of Sheol slash Hades within the intermediate state of existence. Once again, as with the issue of Hades and Gehenna, we do not have to assume that because Peter used a Greek proper noun familiar to his audience, that Peter meant to infer that all of the accompanying ideas of Greek mythology were valid. In order to better understand what in fact Peter was talking about, we need to look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 and place it into context. Quote, And there did come also false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers who shall bring in besides destructive sects, and the master who bought them, denying, bringing to themselves quick destruction, and many shall follow out their destructive ways, because of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of, and in covetousness with molded words of you shall they make merchandise, whose judgment of old is not idle, and their destruction doth not slumber. For if God's messengers who sinned did not spare, but with chains of thick gloom, having cast them down to Tartarus, did deliver them to judgment, having been reserved, and the old world did not spare. But the eighth person, Noah of righteousness, a preacher, did keep a flood on the world of the impious, having brought, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, having turned to ashes, with an overthrow, did condemn an example to those about to be impious, having set them, and righteous lot worn down by the conduct and lasciviousness of the impious, he did rescue, for in seeing and hearing the righteous man dwelling among them, 
Day by day, the righteous soul with unlawful works was harassing, unquote. Now, notice in verse 4 that the topic of Tartarus is some messengers who sinned, and God did not spare, but instead God cast them down to Tartarus to await judgment. Immediately, the question is, who were these messengers, and when did this happen? Well, in verse 5, we get some answers when Peter says that, quote, and that old world did not spare, unquote. This is clearly a reference to the flood, as verified by Peter, next referencing Noah, who was a close, if not immediate, contemporary to these messengers. So the question remains, who are these messengers? Well, the first clue is in the original language, translated, quote-unquote, messenger. In the original language of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the Greek word, quote, angelos, unquote, appears. The English transliteration for this word is, quote, angel, unquote, or, quote, angels, unquote. The King James and other translations of the Bible often substitute the word, quote, messenger, unquote, for, quote, angel, unquote, because the primary mission or function of an angel is that of a messenger from or of God. Now, the issue of angels or messengers gets complicated because the same Greek word, quote, angelos, unquote, can also be used of both literal spiritual beings created by God who both minister and are messengers of God, and also human beings, such as Paul, Peter, and other apostles and or ministers, who are inspired by God to bring his message to his people. Thus, it is not uncommon to read the epistles of the New Testament, where various people like Paul, Peter, and the other apostles may at times refer to themselves or others as, quote, angelos, unquote, or messengers. They are not inferring that they are spiritual beings created by God. They are referring to themselves as humble vessels who are used by God to reveal his message to his people. Well, naturally, this begs the question as to whether Paul is referring to literal angels or human messengers in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. In order to address this question, we turn to Jude chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, which most commentators agree is an account of the very same issue. Quote, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going about strange flesh, are set forth for an example." suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, unquote. So, in comparing Jude and Peter, there can be little doubt that the two apostles are referring to the same event. Fortunately, Jude's commentary gives us the added information that the angels, or messengers in this case, did not, quote, keep their first estate, but left their own habitation, unquote. Further, these angels, quote, gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, unquote. These details together draw a bullseye on Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 as the incident in question. 
Quote, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown." Unquote. Now, as difficult as these three sources are to reconcile, the rabbinic Jewish understanding was that during the time of Noah, there were literal angels who became enamored of the women of Noah's day. These angels were somehow able to forsake their original created status by God as heavenly angels and were able to take on physical form in order to have carnal relationships with human females. Apparently, these relationships produced hybrid offspring referred to variously as, quote, mighty men of old, men of renown, giants, or Nephilim, unquote. Following the logic of the narratives, some or all of these angels who had fallen were then cast by God into Tartarus, where they are to await their eventual final judgment on the last day. So, in essence, despite these angels having the greatest face-to-face -face knowledge and understanding of God possible, they elected to forsake God and their estate for physical pleasure. As a result, they had committed the greatest of all imaginable rebellion. Consequently, they deserved the lowest and greatest of all punishment possible. In Peter's day and to Peter's audience, Tartarus was already considered to be such a place. Tartarus was an ideal imagery for the concept he was trying to convey. This is likely why he used it. This being said, given the fact that the word Tartarus is used only once in the Bible, we can't become too dogmatic about its specifics since we have nothing else in Scripture to triangulate with. In short, the use of the term Tartarus simply serves to reinforce the Old and New Testament belief that the intermediate state was one characterized by having different levels, compartments, or dimensions with various labels such as Sheol, Hades, and Tartarus. Next, we have number nine, Paradise. The Greek word translated paradise comes from a Persian root word meaning, quote, park, preserve, enclosed garden, or forest, unquote. This word appears only three places in the New Testament as follows. Number one, Luke chapter 23, verse 43, quote, and Jesus said unto him, referring to the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Unquote. Number 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, where Paul relates his conversion experience on the Damascus road. Quote, How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter." Unquote. And finally, number three, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, quote, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God." Unquote. 
Now, in addition to these references, the Septuagint translators use the Greek word for paradise to translate the Hebrew word meaning, quote, Eden, unquote, or, quote, Garden of Eden, unquote. During the intertestamental period, rabbinic literature, as well as apocryphal and pseudographical literature, used this word extensively to define the place where the righteous faithful who physically died had their soul slash spirit go to reside during the intermediate state awaiting resurrection from the dead. Once again, the literature and thinking of this time was that the intermediate state was characterized as a state which was compartmentalized into different sections, levels, or dimensions. Each section or compartment was a consequence of how that person had lived during their physical life, and more importantly, what that person's relationship or lack thereof, was with God. Hence, those who lived their lives characterized by faith in the living God would have their soul slash spirit reside in paradise, which in some schools of thought was a compartment within Sheol slash Hades. Contrasting those who lived their lives characterized by immorality, wickedness, and rebellion towards God would have their soul slash spirit reside in Sheol slash Hades apart from paradise. The general description, atmosphere, and characterization of what paradise versus non-paradise in Sheol slash Hades looks like is perhaps nowhere better described than by Jesus himself in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31. Here, Jesus not only reflects the rabbinic-slash-Jewish understanding of paradise, but, in fact, he ratifies it as being fully God. Quote, And a certain man was rich, and was clothed in purple and fine linen, making merry sumptuously every day. And there was a certain poor man by the name of Lazarus, who was laid at his porch, full of sores, and desiring to be filled from the crumbs that are falling from the table of the rich man. Yea, also the dogs coming were licking his sores. And it came to pass that that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the messengers to the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man also died and was buried And in the Hades, having lifted up his eyes, being in torments, he doth see Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And having cried, he said, Father Abraham, deal kindly with me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and may cool my tongue, because I am distressed in this flame." And Abraham said, Child, remember that thou did receive thou thy good things in thy life, and Lazarus in like manner the evil things, and now he is comforted, and thou art distressed. And besides all these things, between us and you a great chasm is fixed, so that they who are willing to go over from hence unto you are not able nor do they from thence to us pass through. And he said, I pray thee then, Father, that thou mayest send him to the house of my father. For I have five brothers, so that he may thoroughly testify to them that they also may not come to this place of torment. Abraham saith to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if any one from the dead may go unto them, they will reform. And he said to him, If Moses and the prophets they do not hear, neither, if any one may rise out of the dead, will they be persuaded. So here 
we encounter a parable by Jesus concerning two people who had physically died. One person's soul, Lazarus, was in conscious comfort and peace in the intermediate state. The second, the rich man's soul, was consciously distressed and discomforted in flames. The fate of each is seen here as a result of their respective treatment regarding their faith in God. In other words, one honored, feared, and had faith in God, and the other was only concerned with the riches of here and now. The only indication of where these people were is to say that Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham, or Abraham's bosom, which many believe to be one and the same as that of paradise. What is important is to see that this parable clearly supports the idea of conscious punishment and or conscious comfort for the soul slash spirit of every man after their physical death in separate areas or dimensions of the intermediate state. Now, the term paradise tends to create confusion as the linguistic term and its definition cross the threshold of the New Testament. For example, in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, we see that Jesus promises the thief on the cross that he will be with Jesus in, quote, paradise, unquote, today, as in immediately, as soon as they both physically die. At that point, they would both be in paradise. For many, then and now, the perspective was and is that Jesus and the thief, as well as anyone else who went to paradise up to that point, would be together. In addition, as we saw from our earlier discussion in episode 3, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 and 19, and Philippians chapter 2 verses 8 through 11, all make the case for the, quote, descensus ad inferos, unquote, where Jesus descended into the, quote, lower parts, unquote, and, quote, led captivity captive, unquote. In keeping with biblical theology, we would now identify the area where Jesus descended to as paradise because that's where Jesus promised to meet the thief and also because that's where everyone who physically died in faith had their soul slash spirit reside after death. The confusion comes as we arrive at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 and Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 and 4 say, quote, And I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter, unquote. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 reads, quote, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. Unquote. In 2 Corinthians, we see that the indication that Paul, or, or whoever the subject is here, is, quote, caught up into paradise, unquote. This would be in contrast to Jesus, quote, descending, unquote, according to Ephesians 1 Peter, and Philippians. Additionally, in Revelation, we see that the tree of life is now in, quote, the midst of the paradise of God, unquote. However, the clear teaching of Scripture is that the, quote, tree of life, unquote, is made inaccessible to everyone because of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. The tree of life does not become accessible again until Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, 
after God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Thus, it would appear that paradise is now no longer associated with Sheol slash Hades, but rather with heaven itself. The question and the debate was and is, where was or where is paradise in a geographical dimensional sense? Some would argue that paradise was a subcompartment, separate area, or different dimension of Sheol slash Hades as previously discussed. Others would argue that paradise was in fact a subcompartment, separate area, or different dimension of heaven. However, if we have learned anything at this point, we would what we have learned is that these various terms all communicate infinite, eternal, spiritual, and potentially extra-dimensional realities, which presently we can only partially hope to understand, given our finite, fallen minds, as well as the limitations of human language. As such, the exact physical dimensions, the metaphysical nature and mechanical workings of death, Sheol, Hades, the intermediate state, Gehenna, Paradise, and the remaining terms are issues which we cannot fully comprehend any more than we can fully comprehend the fullness of the Trinity or God in all his wisdom. Having said this, the explanation is that because of the atoning work of Christ on the cross, that during his event of his descent into the lower places, i.e. paradise, Christ was able to change the status, nature, and or location of paradise. Whether this is an actual physical, geographical, dimensional address change, or whether it was some other metaphysical existential change, the point is that Christ accomplished change, guaranteeing that according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, that, quote, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, unquote. For the time being, however, this will conclude this episode. Please join me for part 7 of this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Around me I rest and know that he